It is November 23rd, 2020, and you are listening to episode 22 of the Candid Clarinetist podcast. What's going on, everybody? Sam Rothstein here, acting principal clarinet with the Indianapolis Symphony Orchestra and host of the Candid Clarinetist podcast. If you not if you have not seen yet, I have posted a list of upcoming podcast guests on both our Instagram and Facebook pages. In addition to our guests today, we will be having Ixi Chen next week, who is the second clarinetist of the Cincinnati Symphony Orchestra and the founder of the Digital Clarinet Academy. Jack Everly, principal pops conductor of the Indianapolis Symphony Orchestra, will be joining us on the 7th of December to talk about the Yuletide celebration and his fabulous career as a pops conductor. On the 14th of December, I will be speaking with Jackie Glazer, who is the assistant professor of clarinet at the University of Arizona, and we're going to be talking about college auditions. So if you're in high school and looking to go to music school, this will be the episode for you. Also, I'm sort of planning a kind of fun holiday special, so definitely stay tuned for that. That'll be uh, fun the the week before uh, Christmas. Uh, I could really use everyone's help getting the word out about the Candy Clarinetist podcast. If you are new to the podcast, please like, subscribe, and share our material on social media, and make sure to tell all of your friends and family about it. I've been so humbled to see the growth of it to this point, but I really need the help of all of our wonderful listeners to continue the expansion of the podcast. Remember that the two easiest ways to support us here are to share our content and to subscribe to the podcast on your favorite podcasting platform. Michael Mock is our terrific guest for today. Michael is the Associate Director and Dean of Fellows at the Tanglewood Music Center, and he can correct me in a moment if I got his title incorrect. (laughs) Um, My life forever changed back in 2012 when I was a first-year fellow at the Tanglewood Music Center, and I attribute the largest musical and personal growth that I've ever experienced to the three summers that I was fortunate to spend there. I wanted to invite Michael on to talk about all things TMC and just give him a chance to brag about how awesome both he and his job is. So thanks so much for spending some time with me tonight, Michael. Thanks, Sam. It's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to hear from you. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's really nice to see you again. I think it's been probably five years since we were able yeah. to work together. So it's it's really nice to uh, reconnect in this, in this setting. So uh, just a, a little overview. Can you just uh, tell us the different programs that are offered at the TMC and sort of how, you know, people can sort of find out about them. Oh, well, um, there's about 140 to 150 students each summer at the TMC. And we don't usually use the word student. We say fellow. They're mm-hmm. all there in a full fellowship. It's a full ride, uh, room and board. And the 150 fellows are split uh, among a couple different programs. There's an orchestra, as you know, uh, in which you played. Uh, there's a vocal program. There are conductors, composers, uh, orchestra librarians, pianists. Uh, so while the core of Tanglewood is obviously the uh, residency of the Boston Symphony and the orchestra is very active in teaching, uh, there's a lot more to Tanglewood uh, than just orchestral playing. There's also a lot of chamber music. There are these other programs. Uh, wonderful resident faculty in voice and composition and conducting. So it's, uh, you know, you got your foundation of the orchestra, but then just a the whole lot more going on there. Yeah. And, you know, I, one thing that I thought was interesting is, of course, all the fellows kind of, we'll get into this a little bit later, but mm-hmm. I'd say the majority of the fellows live in sort of the same residence. And, uh, you know, you'd be at breakfast and you'd meet someone and they're, you know, what do you do or what instrument do you play? <laughs> oh, I'm the uh, piano technician fellow. Like, what? I, I didn't even know that was a thing. So, yeah, it's it's pretty crazy. And you get to know, like, all these different people, and you all sort of uh, mesh together, not only mm-hmm. because you're living together, but, um, you know, you work intimately with people from the other programs, mm-hmm. you know, especially, uh, you know, um, with the Festival of Contemporary Music. Like, I spent so much time with singers because there's these chamber mm-hmm. contemporary pieces. And so that's, I always find it interesting that it's a little melting pot of just, you know, not only musicians, but, but just the industry. Yeah, I mean, it's it's immersive and it's intense. And you're packed together in a residence and you're packed together uh, in, you know, in music and activities. And the kind of uh, connections you're describing are exactly what we want. You know, you're not just hanging out with your friends in the orchestra. You're meeting singers, you're meeting composers. 
Uh, you know, there are fellows at Tanglewood, instrumentalists or, or singers who, you know, connect with the composer, and then that turns into a relationship that goes on for years, you know, with the composer writing works uh, for the performer. And that's exactly the kind of relationship that we want to see develop there. And it happens both on stage and off. It's the fellows work hard, they, they, they play hard, they socialize. <laughs> it, is, it, is a, it is a little world in a bubble for two months each summer. Yeah, absolutely. So um, can you speak briefly about, you know, the requirements for applying, like maybe uh, the general age group, uh, what the audition process is like, how one can sort of, uh, you know, is there pre-screening? Like what what process do people have to go through? And and maybe uh, I, I know it's probably different this year and you can you can maybe touch on that. But what uh, what are the sort of the deadlines that people need to look out for uh, with these requirements? <laughs> Yeah, so let me, I'll speak first as if it were a normal year, good, um, yeah. which it very much isn't. Uh, the, the processes are going to differ um, from program to program. So, and they tend to be pretty much in sync with other festivals and the timelines that comparable festivals follow. So we're a, you would say a college age festival that is we're generally between the ages of 18 and all the way up to 30, really, in some areas. Um, but the average age is around 22, 23. So you're generally talking about people who are getting to the end of their undergraduate education and maybe in the beginning part of their graduate studies. But it really, it runs the gamut. Uh, you know, in a program uh, like the vocal program, you know, the voice is very different than the violin in terms of how it matures and, and, and the point at which a singer is ready to come to a program like Tanglewood. Um, so... The processes for all those programs are different too. So the orchestral program uh, auditions happen in February, so the deadlines tend to happen around January, and it's uh, there's no pre-screen for that. It's a live audition. We, you can apply by uh, sending a video as well, but we, live audition is strongly preferred. It's a 10-minute audition. Uh, it's adjudicated by members of the BSO and our resident faculty. And if you're a violinist, you're going to probably play two orchestral excerpts and two chamber music excerpts and two concertos. Um, as a clarinetist, you know well that you'll play the Mozart concerto. And then, you know, some of your... I know that one, I think. Yeah, I've you heard know of that before, one. yeah. Uh, and then some of your more usual uh, clarinet excerpts, your Daphnis, your Midsummer Night's Dream, your Beethoven Six. So we try to keep the orchestral excerpts pretty standard so that, you know, drawing from this literature that's, you know, commonly studied in schools and shows up on a... Uh, festival audition lists. Um, it's a pretty competitive uh, program to get into. Overall, uh, the acceptance rate is around 8%. It used to get somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, you know 1,500 applicants, and it varies by program. So like in the conducting program, where you get you know, 120 applicants, that's uh, that application happens in November, uh, you accept two. So yeah, the wow. acceptance rate is like, you know, almost 1%. Um, you can check my math on that. Um, <laughs> a, a vocal program, that's also in the fall. Uh, so is the composition program. Uh, those are a little different. Uh, the vocal program does have a pre-screen, uh, then an invitation to a live audition. Composers are obviously sending works, and conductors are, are sending videos as they tend to. So it's quite a full year of, you know, once the summer is over, we get back to the hall in September, and we need to, we're sort of off and running, accepting applications right away for three programs, vocal, composition, conducting, dealing with those applications, auditions, and then also getting ready for the, the instrumental process is a it, it is the most complex of all the uh, uh, you know programs with the length of the tour and the sort of way it, it interlocks with one itself and getting BSO players who are available to listen and travel. And uh, it's just a, the February tour is quite an undertaking. And I must say, I... I'm going to miss it, even though it, it's it's quite mm -hmm. an undertaking. I'll miss it this year. Yeah, so it sounds to me that, uh, and I'm sure you're probably going to correct me, but it seems like the process leading up to those eight weeks over the summer is more busy for you than the actual eight weeks. And you're kind of saying, eh, maybe. <laughs> maybe. Well, so one thing I always say, you know, Tanglewood is, I mean, you know, it's 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 packed. I mean, seven days a week, um, you know, 12 hours a day. And, you know, not all of that is like I'm sitting at my desk, you know, working on a spreadsheet. I get to go to concerts, too. That's part of my job is I probably attend, you know, anywhere from six to eight hours of concerts a week at Tanglewood. And, you know, being part of the community and, and, and watching the fellows play and hearing them and, you know, 
being part of their musical life is is part of it. That's one of the best parts of it. So, you know, Tanglewood is quite packed. Um, it's some late nights, some long days. But I've always said that February, the audition tour, is actually the hardest month uh, of the job. Just in the like, first of all, the traveling. You know, you're on the road for three weeks typically. It's not just me; it's colleagues of mine that we split it up with. But we're all running around the country. There's equipment to drag around, travel to coordinate, and then deliberations. Um, it's a it's a pretty nonstop month. Yeah, but, um, and so you, you keep talking about the uh, audition tour. So. Um, you guys go to, uh, is it major cities across the U.S., and it's sort of like a couple days here, a couple days there, and you hit all the major yeah. music schools, I guess? Yeah, we basically go where the, the major schools are. Um, you know, West Coast, L.A., uh, we used to do San Francisco, but we haven't in a while. Um, we do Houston, Cleveland, uh, Chicago, Cincinnati for voice, uh, Bloomington. Uh, we go down to New World and do a day down there. We do a day in Philly, at Curtis. We do New York, of course, of course, Boston. Um, you know, we're always hoping that we can expand the tour. Uh, when I started in this job 15 years ago, we didn't go to LA. So one of the first things we did was push into that area, sort of right around the time that Colburn was really like taking off and, mm -hmm. you know, you know, you know, finding its traction. So that's obviously a, it's a lot of talent out there. Where did you audition when you auditioned? Chicago. And actually it's funny you're mentioning all these people because uh, the only person at my audition was Gary. Yeah. <laughs> and I, is, is Gary still working there? I, I don't Gary, know. Gary's around. Okay, yeah, cool. Um, um, yeah, it was funny because I like walked in and, and some other people who had gone the day before were like, oh, yeah, there was some members of the BSO there. And and I was like, it was just me and Gary hanging out. <laughs> yeah, the, the wind committee doesn't tend to travel as much. Gotcha. Uh, you know, one of the problems is that this tour takes place in February. That's usually when Andres is around. So, like, in, mm -hmm. you know, most of the... Uh, uh, section reps on the faculty or principal players, so it's hard for them to sort of get out of town right? Uh, when the music director is around. Um, and then you talked about the, uh, you know, the standard excerpts and stuff. Are those excerpt lists curated by the section representatives? Is yeah. that how it works? So basically every uh, section in the orchestra has a representative for the TMC, and that person uh, is kind of the shepherd for that section. So, you know, when you were Tom Martin, I'm sure when you were mm -hmm. a, a fellow who's yep. the associate principal clarinet, um, fantastic guy and like one of the best players you can imagine. Unbelievable. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and he can do it all. You know, you hear him like oh, tear yeah. it up in the pops with, you know, jazz or then he'll play like Carter. Oh, I, I mean, remember just, he was practicing bass clarinet in like a random sh hut. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and. I was the bass clarinet fellow, and I like walked by. I'm like, "Who is that?" And he's just shredding, like putting me to shame. Not that I expect anything else from him, but you know, <laughs> he's a, he's something. One week it's like, you know, oh, we didn't hire a saxophone player to come in and do this, and he plays it. Like, oh, he's great at that too. Yeah. <laughs> um, but we digress. I, I we love Tom. Yes. Um, so the you know Tom would I connect with Tom in the fall, and I say, "What do you want to be on the audition list?" And you know, we tweak it. Sometimes we look at uh, you know the excerpts, you know, uh, you know that are common to the repertoire we're doing. So you know, we're doing. Uh, you know, uh, you know, could I this summer and we're going to throw one of those uh, on the list. Um, but usually, you know, sort of stick to most of the standard stuff. Um, and then the process just sort of follows through with Tom. You know, he, he works on the list. We come to the auditions. He hears the auditions. He works on deliberations with his colleagues. Um, and each section does it a little differently. You know, they get together with the other members of their section or they get together with people from other sections and they sort of listen together and, you know, confer. So then, you know, decisions are made, and then Tom is still working with me on, with all the staff on. Now we need to do seatings and master classes and chamber music, and who's going to play what. So, you know, one thing we don't do at Tango with our uh, seating auditions. You know, some festivals you show up and you need to, you know, play another audition to see where you're going to sit in orchestra. So all the seatings at Tango would rotate. So the BSO players are making these castings based on what they remember from the auditions. So it's like, oh, this I remember this kid. He'd be really good at, you know, this and just sort of spreading it out evenly. So everyone gets a chance to, you know, basically sit everywhere uh, in the orchestra. Everyone's going to play a little E flat, perhaps mm -hmm. um, that kind of thing. Uh, so it's you know, the process is and then in the summer it's the same thing. That section rep a representative there is the shepherd. And, you know, the idea is that and I'm sure I hope this is true of you. And I'm, I'm, I'm sure it was you develop these relationships with the BSO players you know, they're mentorships, but, um, you know, one of the, 
one of the players, uh, Dan Bausch, who's in the percussion section, who I've known for a long time, he's the section rep for the percussion. He says, you know, it's not like they're students. They're kind of like about to be my colleagues. Yeah. And the relationship is as much, you know, collegial as it is as, you know, student and, and teacher in a lot of cases. Yeah. And I really uh, appreciated that about the teachers there, um, that they, they, that's how they taught was with that relationship in mind because, uh, you know, the, the, the students coming in are so high level that they're kind of just there to kind of give you that last bit, little kick and be like, you know, have you thought about this? Maybe that, you know, cause they're not trying to teach you how to play the instrument. Everyone there knows how to do it, you know? And so I, I really appreciated that. And I've, and I, you know, Tom and uh, Michael Wayne, who was the other uh, clarinetist who was very involved, uh, be, uh, is Michael in particular became a, a huge mentor of mine, a uh, former guest of the podcast, um, huge mentor of mine. I always, you know, whenever I'm having like a little issue or whatever, I always just, shoot him an email or send him a text or whatever. Hey, you know, what are your thoughts on this? And he always comes back to me with, and, and I feel like our relationship has never been teacher student, but it's just been more like mentorish mentor mentorship. Does that, does that sound right? Yeah, that's right. And you've hit on something uh, important there is, you know, one thing we don't do at Tango is give individual lessons. So when we're talking about teaching, we're talking about master classes and informal conversations, and they might come to the orchestra rehearsal and hear how you're playing and give you a few pointers. But if you go to a festival like Aspen or a music academy, you're going to have a weekly lesson. You're going to be put into a studio with a teacher. And, you know, at Tanglewood, we're looking for the kind of player that's a little bit ready to be untethered from that weekly uh, meeting. You know, be, you know, you've worked out most of the technical things on the instrument and, you know, you're, you're ready for that, as you say, that final push in, in musicality uh, in, in sort of broader con- uh, concepts. Uh, and mentorship. Um, you're not coming into a lesson each week, you know, needing to work on this little nitty gritty aspect of your playing. Mm-hmm. Um, so. And you, you touched on this a little bit, but I just wanted to know, like, you know, how competitive is the audition process? Like, are you finding that you're getting, you know, people who apply five or six times before they get in? Or is it, you know, kind of a mixed bag in terms of that? I mean, you said the percentage is what, 8% acceptance? Yeah, and that varies by program too. Sure. Um, you know, obviously, the section like the violins, where there's 28 of them, you get a better. You know, your odds are a little better. Yeah. Um, but um, yeah, it is competitive, and you know, some people, you know, so a good example of this is uh, I don't know if you know Mary Ferrillo, who uh, mm-hmm. is a violist, and she just won a job in the VSO last year. Yeah, we were there um, together. Yeah, right. Mm-hmm. Okay, so she auditioned several times before she got in, and it was actually really wonderful thing to see, you know, to see her each audition get a little better and then get in. And then she was a tango with for many years. She was a fellow and then she was in the new from players, which is our new music specialty group. And then she won the job in the BSO. So like there's an example of a very much like, okay, boom, step, step, step approach. Then you have people who are like 18 years old and walk in and, and, and get in on their first audition. You yeah. know, the kind of kids oh, I'm yeah. talking about. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I went um, there with one of them actually, and he's, he's yeah. got a fine job as principal bassoonist of the Chicago symphony now. So oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He was, yeah. I think he, when I went there, it was his second summer. And I believe it was like after his freshman year of Curtis. So that yeah. means he, after he graduated high school, he got in. <laughs> Yeah, he got into the TMC before he ever had gone to conservatory. Um, and he was, yeah. I mean, there's been a few people uh, like that over the years. And it's interesting because, you know, they're, they, they have this talent. It's just unbelievable. I mean, they're, they're, that's not in question. But, you know, you're an 18-year-old kid and you're thrown into a dorm in the summer with a bunch of 20-year-old kids. And, uh, you know, <laughs> sometimes it can be, a, you know, a wake-up call to sort of, a, you know, a different world uh, that getting ready for college and stuff like that. But, you know, Keith was great. And, yeah, you know, he could certainly hang musically. That's what he could more than hang oh, musically. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. Um, but uh, while we were talking about, oh, competitive. Yeah, yeah. It, it varies. You know, you see people audition for several years and get in. Some people get in right away. Um, you know, it's obviously the sad cases of people that you see audition several times and, and never quite make it, especially people who are, you know, it varies from year to year, you know, the level of talent you get. So some years you have like, oh, wow, the violins are out of control this year that, you know, mm-hmm. we're going to have a hard time choosing. And then some years, you know, sort of cycles through, maybe it has to do with conservatories and their own cycles of admissions and just like, oh, well, you know, this person's a contender this year, but, you know, they wouldn't have been last year, that kind of thing. And so it's like, you know, sometimes people are really close and. You know, it's again, I was saying this before we before we came on here, you know, that's why I sit on a behind a desk 
because uh, I would not want to participate in the stress uh, of an audition process and just see how hard everyone works and how much they've invested in it. You, know, you want to see everyone get in, basically. Yeah. But, yeah, uh, for sure. It's not the way it works. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's definitely very very difficult. Um, I mean, to get into any music festival over the summer. I mean, there's limited spots, and you're going. You know, if you're a younger student, you're going up against grad students. You know, mm. much more experienced. Um, but I want to encourage everyone. I'm a proud uh, TMC alum that got in off the wait list. So, mm. or as it got out, again on out off the alternate list. And in mm. fact, every festival I've been to, I got in as an alternate. So don't give up. And just because you don't get it the first time, or, you know, I've been rejected more times than I've been on the wait list. And I've been, uh, you know, definitely gone to festivals a lot less than I've been accepted to them. So uh, don't, don't give up if you don't get in the first time. Mm. Uh, maybe try to get some feedback and then just try again the following year. Yeah. And, you know, those alternate lists, you know, if you're if you if you if you end up on an alternate list first, Sam is an object lesson and, you know, you, you can make it off that list. But also that's no small uh, accomplishment at a festival like the the TMC to you know, being an alternate is the line is sometimes razor thin, you know, and again, very hard choices. Uh, you know, I think we could take all of our alternates some years and still have a pretty darn good orchestra. Absolutely, for sure. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about life at the Tangled Music Center. So what can someone expect to do as a fellow? I mean, you mentioned work hard and play hard, but maybe a little bit more specific. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Maybe well, not specific I, about the playing hard, but well, definitely I mean, the working uh, hard. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I, I'll stay into some of the more vanilla areas of there playing hard. <laughs> um, but uh, it, it's a busy place. Um, you know, it's sun up to sundown. Uh, things to do, rehearsals to play concerts to hear, classes to watch. Uh, if you're a member of the orchestra, you know, you have one to two rehearsals a day, uh, either both in orchestra or orchestra and a chamber music project. We're very mindful in terms of playing services at Tanglewood of injury. Um, you know, the musicians are small muscle athletes. They need to be treated that way. Uh, you know, they can't push themselves until they break. So we try not to overschedule playing services in a day, but there's, there's, there's much more to tangle with than that. Um, you know, there's a concert every night of the week. Um, and sometimes, you know, more than one concert on one day on the weekends. And uh, fellows are all strongly encouraged to hear their concert, their fellows, uh, uh colleagues perform. Um, and of course, go here at the BSO. Hearing the BSO three times a week in three different concerts is, is as much as part of learning there as playing in your own concerts. Um, so the days are busy. Um, if you're a singer, um, similar type of busyness. Uh, you're going to have some rehearsals. You'll be working on art song. Uh, singers have studio classes in the mornings. Uh, there's a lot of master classes. I'll mention the instrumentalists to go back to that. They have one master class a week as well, usually Wednesdays or Thursdays. Um, I mean, it's just music is happening all around you. You know, if you don't have if you, if you don't have a rehearsal, there's something else you can find to go check out. Whether it's you can watch a BSO rehearsal. Uh, fellows have the ability to sign up to sit on the stage within the BSO section. So if you're a trumpet player and you want to go sit right behind Tom Rolfs while he plays Mahler Five, you know, you can do that. Um, so we're always encouraging fellows to take care of, take advantage of every opportunity that they have uh, to do that kind of thing. You know, if you're a violinist and you don't have anything on that afternoon and there's a vocal masterclass, maybe you want to go see Stephanie Blythe teach, you know, it's, uh, you're welcome to, you know, everything is open to everyone. Um, so it's it's a busy time in terms of the sort of recreational side of that. Um, you know, kidding aside, the Berkshires is a gorgeous place. Uh, there are amazing hikes. There are amazing other arts organizations like Shakespeare and Company, uh, Jacob's Pillow, a dance festival, uh, museums, uh, Mass Mocha, the Contemporary uh, Art Museum up in North Adams. I mean, there's so much else to do there, and a lot of fellows are very, you know, you know. Young musicians, I find, don't do anything halfway. So it's like, oh, you know, I'm really good at my instrument. Also, I'm like a competitive, like, bike racer, you know, or something <laughs> right. like that, you know. so That's me, you for know, sure. <laughs> yeah. You know, they have extreme, you know, they, they're extremely dedicated to everything. So, you know, a lot of, lot of athletic stuff going on, you know, getting games together, soccer, basketball, going for hikes. There's a lake, swimming. Um, you know, obviously there's, you know, there's nightlife, you know, there are bars in town for those who are of age and want to enjoy responsibly. Uh, it's a great way to get to know your colleagues and, and bond in that way. We have, you know, we have parties after concerts. Um, 
you know, we, we try to make it as much about that sense of community as we do about the music. It's the same community, basically, both musically and, and extra, mu- extra musically. Mm-hmm. And I want to go back to something you said earlier where it's a fully immersive environment there. And I think that was one thing that sort of struck me is like everyone's mind is just on music all the time and you're so you're in this beautiful area and the best thing is that the Tanglewood campus is so big, right? And so there's always just more than one thing going on. There's dozens and dozens of things going on at one time. So, you know, you'll get done with rehearsal, maybe you only play on one piece. You just take a walk across the lawn, you go and you hear the BSO rehearse or you maybe pop into a hut and you see a, you know, a, a master class with Don Upshaw or you mm-hmm. walk, uh, you know, um, across and you see yo-yo ma playing his cello in the grass like i mean and like you're laughing but like that actually happens yeah. <laughs> you know it's pretty crazy the uh the cafeteria is like that sort of famously for whatever it is 80 years now at tanglewood you know it's a place where you're going to sit down and you'll see bso players eating and fellows eating and there's this you know this week's soloist and conductor eating uh you know it's just a place where you know it's you know everybody's kind of just folks just you know all citizens of tanglewood so. Yeah, and I think one of the coolest moments for me, and this is not about me, but I feel like I can offer an anecdote here, is uh, we were rehearsing the uh, time pieces by Lucas Foss, right? Yep. Lucas Foss, yeah. Um, and we were in the old, uh, is the theater, is that what the it's called? Theater. Yeah. yeah. We were in the theater, and this was like right after Andres Nelson was named the music director. And mm. I think he was like just visiting. It was like his first visit to Tanglewood as the, you know, music director designate. Um And he just like, we were rehearsing or whatever, and he just like walked in and like sat down in the audience and just like Mm. listened to us rehearse because he wanted to hear the acoustic of the place. It was like the most like, I was like, well, I hope you liked my playing. (laughs) It was just so bizarre to like see someone of that stature just like walk in and sit down on a rehearsal and like genuinely just like wanted to listen and like hear how it sounded. Yeah. I mean, he's the nicest guy in the world. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, that's, that's, you know, but that's it. That's exactly the kind of thing, you know, we want to see happen at Tanglewood. Um, yeah, he's, uh, he's been great. It has been, it's really sad to have not seen him in a year. Yeah. Absolutely. Essentially. Is he uh, still, uh, this is a little bit off topic, but is he, I'm sure he probably can't travel right he now. He can't. Yeah. He's in Germany. He yeah. can't, he couldn't come over here if he was able to. Um, yeah. Wow. What a crazy time, huh? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so um, let's uh, let's get back to the TMC uh, living arrangements, and I, I touched mm. on this earlier, where um, you know there is a, a, a sort of residence for most of the fellows, but I know there's some other options as well. So you can you maybe just talk about like what what's to expect there. Well, so and it may be a little different than it was in your day because we've made some tweaks mm-hmm. over the years. But the main residence is uh, Miss Hall School, which is during the year of boarding school for young women, high school age. And um, they rent the facility to us in the summer. And I think even since you've been there, Sam, they've made some amazing upgrades. I air don't conditioning know or no? There. What? No air, air conditioning. Oh, okay. No air conditioning. <laughs> they haven't That's made the body. best upgrade yet. <laughs> they're, they're, and, they're, and they never will. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> they're not going to spend the money uh, since we're the <laughs> only ones there in the summer. That's true. But, uh, for example, I don't know if we, when you lived in those rooms, if they had that terrible carpeting in the dorm rooms. They're now all hardwood floors. Oh, yeah. The They've redone the living room, the dining room. I mean, it's just a great facility, and they take really good care of us. Um, you know, they're mostly double room accommodations, though over the years I've managed to make some rooms so that we can give out more singles. Um, there's also off-campus options. For, when you were there, did you ever live off-campus? Yeah, Sammy, I did lived- uh, when I was a from, and I did my second year. Um, yeah. So we used to rent a few houses and sort of lottery them off to the people who wanted to live off-campus. Now what we do is give a stipend and say – you know, here's some money. Basically, here's what we would have spent on gotcha. you yeah. to, to live at the dorm, and please feel free to go, you know, form households with your colleagues, and you know, uh, you know, find your own house. But um, you know, it's close quarters. It's part of the Tanglewood experience. Okay, so it's you know, I won't sugarcoat it. You know, you have people who are maybe 24, 25 years old. You know, who haven't lived in a dorm room in five years. They have their own apartment. Maybe they're married. Um, and they're suddenly going to be in this dormitory where they might have a roommate in sort of a, you know, 10 by 10 room. Uh, yeah. You know, it's not it's not always ideal for everyone. But the, the thing I, you know, it's two months. And it, it really is part of uh, the, the experience, the, the, the immersion of being in this facility. And, you know, we've been at Miss Hall School for, I think, 40 years. 
and you know the some of the greatest musicians in the world, orchestral musicians, have been through this exact experience. You know, they slept where you slept. Hopefully, not on the same mattresses. They probably changed those out. <laughs> yeah, is uh, that is that an upgrade that they made as well? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. But um, you know, it, it's it's part of the experience, and uh, you know, most people come to love it. People who come in like, oh, I don't know, I'm gonna have a roommate. I'm 25 years old. At the end of the summer, they'll say, oh, I love my roommate. We, you know, we we became great friends. Uh, you know, that relationship has gone on for years. Um, you know, so it's uh, as long as people keep an open mind, it's it's a pretty good living situation. Yeah, for and, sure. And uh, shout out to my my buddy uh, Nick Brown, uh, bassist yeah. with the San Antonio Symphony, I believe is where he is now. He was uh, he was my roommate my first year there. Uh, he he did he, I, he's a riot. The guy's an absolute riot. Um, and he used to do this thing called Wolf Shirt Wednesdays, where every Wednesday he'd wear a shirt with like a noble wolf on it. It was. <laughs> <laughs> the guy was a character, man. I remember um, Nick. But like, I never would have met Nick. Probably, I certainly never would have lived with him if it weren't for the TMC. And so, it's it's kind of fun to uh, to experience stuff like that. He's super rad. So, um, so now I want to give you a chance to sort of brag about yourself because you, oh. um, you, you know, you don't really get a lot of attention, um, but you need more attention because you really make. Uh, a conscious choice to connect with all the fellows and to keep up with them and to make sure they're having a good time. And, you know, I always thought of you as just like this great friend that I could always come to. And it was like, we knew each other forever. So, so I wanted to thank you for that. Cause I feel like your role there is really important. Um, and, uh, you know, it, your roles evolved a little bit over the years that you spent there. So can you maybe just talk about uh, your career a little yeah. bit there? I mean, uh, thank you for saying all that. I, I don't know if people can tell I'm blushing with my ring light here, but, um, <laughs> You know, I I don't, I I don't need to. Uh, I I don't uh, particularly feel the need to say I'll get, you know pay attention to me. Uh, I think I get plenty of attention. But um, you know, the thing that I have have loved is, is getting to know the fellows. I mean, it has been tremendous. Um, and that's changed over the years. So when you were a fellow in 2012, you know that was eight years ago. I was a younger man. Uh, there was none of this gray uh, in, in the beard then. <laughs> Um, and when I started the job, I was even younger. I started in uh, 2006, and you know I was much closer in age to the fellows, and so I felt like I could kind of be like a little bit more pally and like I'm the I'm the cool uncle, yeah. Uh, you know, and as I've gotten older, <laughs> I mean, I hate to say that, you know, as my age has gotten farther and farther apart from the fellows, you know, it's a just a different generation. You know, mm -hmm. it's harder. It's a little harder to relate um, and sort of get into their world. And I sort of feel that. Um, but I mean, that's, that's still the very core of what I'm trying to do is establish relationships, um, you know, understand their experience, especially because, you know, for future summers, I want to know like the real feedback. I don't want to know the sort of, oh, it was great. Like, you know, you would say, obviously, if you want to make your teacher happy or you don't want to say a negative thing or, you know, you're trying to please everyone. But I, if, you know, if someone has a bad time or is not experiencing tango to the fullest, I'd like to know. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to get that honest feedback uh, so we can make improvements in future years. And the only way to really get that kind of honest feedback is to establish that relationship and a rapport where, you know, a fellow feels that they can trust you um, and open up if they're having a problem, whether it's a musical problem or a problem with one of their colleagues. Um, you have to have that sort of openness, um, uh, you, know, in, you know, in terms of sort of welcoming that kind of relationship. And it's been tremendously rewarding. I mean, the, you know, my best, some of my best friends now, um, uh, a few of them were fellows, like, you know, 14 years ago, and mm -hmm. then they joined the BSO, and like, you know, we're never just good friends now. You know, I was in, Tom Siders was a fellow in like 2009 or something like that, and he joined the BSO in 2010, and a few years later, a few years later, I was in his wedding. Yeah. You know, like, <laughs> yeah. you know, that kind of thing. You know, it's one of my best friends. So, like, to carry those relationships on are great too. You know, and then I would go out on the audition tour, and I'd come to a city, and, you know, someone's doing their master's there that was a fellow like three years ago, and I get to see them, and maybe we have a drink, or we just catch up, and just sort of continue that that relationship um these are important uh, also to know what's going out on out there in the industry you know like someone like yourself who's in Inna indianapolis uh to know your experience there and it's great to reconnect with you and hear how things are going over there because you know these it's the same thing for an administrator as it is uh for the fellows you make these connections and they inform the way you look at the profession and the way you look at the world so i've been really really fortunate um to make these connections um, and know some of the amazing musicians I've known.
Yeah. And I, I, if I can tell a brief story about you, if you don't mind, um, <laughs> it's not embarrassing, but I've always said that nobody loves Tanglewood as much as you do. <laughs> I, I think that's possibly objectively true. <laughs> um, but I remember when I came back for uh, to be a from, uh, you, there's like a, a welcome, right? You, you go in, you get your packet here, you're living here, whatever. And then they take your picture, right? Because mm-hmm. it's for... Yeah, it's just uh, it's, so we can figure out who everyone is, basically. Gotcha, yeah. gotcha. And I remember like I came in and I was a from, so I was like, I don't even know if I need to be here or whatever. And you're like, oh, hey, Sam, you know, here you go. Here, here's where your house is or whatever. Mm-hmm. And then you're like, I want to see the camera so I can see if I remember who who's everyone you know who everyone's name is. And you were like looking through the camera and you were like, oh, this this person and this person this person. So it was just funny to like see you like go through the camera. You're like you were just like so excited that everyone was had arrived. <laughs> yeah, I mean that's always a fun day when they all show up. And I and I wish I could tell you I was as good at remembering everyone's name as I was back when you were a fellow. <laughs> Certainly not as good as I used to be. But that used to be a big priority for me was to try to learn everyone's name in the first couple of days. And it's pretty easy when you have the orchestra seating in front of you and you can kind of go in and really, yeah. really study. And so people are like, why is he looking at me for so long? And I'm like, <laughs> memorize face, you know. But um, that's a real priority, you know, yeah. to learn the names. That's pretty impressive if uh, after a couple of days you can remember, you know, 140 some odd people. But I guess, you know, if it's your job, you know. It's... Well, you know, you got about 40 people who are returning, so that helps. Uh... <laughs> sure, yeah, that definitely helps, helps cut down the, some of the numbers. Um, well, that's great. And then, like, what, you know, so you talked about the audition tour, and, of course, you do a lot of the administration stuff. So during the summer, uh, what is, are you are you mainly just like the, uh, do you put out a lot of fires? Do you just kind of solve the quite Yeah, you solve the issues that come up. Uh, is it is it planning for the next cup, couple of weeks? Is it scheduling? Like, what's all that that entails with that? I mean, it's all that. I mean, the festival is kind of like a top. You know, you start it spinning, and then when it falls over, you pick it up again. Yeah. Um, so you do a lot of troubleshooting. Uh, you put out fires. Uh, you know. A lot of things come up. You may have someone who's injured and you need to replace them in a chamber music project. You may have someone who is missing in rehearsal and you got to find them. Uh, you know, you may have a troubled project. This piece isn't going well and does a performance need to be postponed or this needs to be rescheduled or or that, you know, little things like that. Um, and then you have big events that you need to plan for. You need to, you know, everyone on staff takes turns being on duty for concerts and doing concert management and, you uh, you know, certainly, um, you know, sort of shepherding, essentially. I mean, it's just sort of like a big part of the job is just kind of showing up and sort of being there for when things go wrong, you mm-hmm. know, or if someone needs you. So, like, yeah, I know you probably remember, like, I would always come over, you know, orchestra would start at 10. So I'd go over around 945 and hang out, you know, to like 1010 because you see people and how are you and how's it going? And if someone has a question, they'll come find you and you can kind of check in and, and feel what the vibe is. You can tell if it's the middle of the contemporary music festival and everyone seems like they're about ready to fall over and see if you can help them with that, uh, that kind of thing. So it's that. And actually, we start um, planning for the following summer in the middle of the current summer. Wow. Okay. So like I said that the vocal tour uh, auditions happen in November. So we start planning that like early August. We start talking about, okay, what's going to happen next year? I mean, you got everybody there at Tanglewood. So it's a great time to meet and say, what's going to happen next summer? What do you want to do? What kind of rep are you thinking about? What kind of projects? You know, we try to grab conductors, you know, during the summer, you know, talk to Andres, what kind of stuff you think you want to do next summer? Like as much as we can get out. And it doesn't always work. Sometimes people don't know or you can't catch them. But as much as you can get out in front of that um, is good. So... Yeah, I mean, there's there's, there's plenty to do. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I I remember we I was living off campus and I, we showed up at our house and like it was only two there's three of us and there's only two beds, and so like I called you and you're like oh I got it and within like a day we had a bed and I was like man this guy knows what he's doing. <laughs> yeah, I mean that's like housing is like uh, to be frank the least my least favorite part of my job. I mean I certainly will do it and I I want it to work, but uh, you know housing. You're dealing with people's living situations. So, you know, yeah. if someone is unhappy, I have a lot of sympathy for that person. You know, it's like you, nobody wants to live. You're here to have this amazing musical experience and then like you have a terrible living situation. You know, that's that's not good. But you can't always fix everything. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the fact of the matter is that like it's always you're always going to have some unhappy people in any housing situation where you're housing people for two months in the summer in a mostly non-air conditioned uh, location. Um, but, uh, 
It's mostly because I know that how I'd feel if I had a bad housing situation. So, but that's why we had to get you a bed. I didn't say here's a sleeping bag or here's an air mattress. We... <laughs> I think you did it first, but we all knew you were joking. <laughs> and we might have deserved it too, but you never know. Yeah. Um, that's awesome, Michael. I, and I think, once again, I think you're the, the definitely, I, you're not underappreciated by those who know you, but I think you're, you know, be, behind the scenes, I think your name deserves to be front and center on every single program book. So, um, well, I, I have a lot of colleagues who I think, you know, I stand on the shoulders of, of, of giants, uh, but uh, I'm probably just louder than everyone. So people pay attention <laughs> to me. But, yeah, that, wor- that works. For the- some people. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that helps for the group picture. That's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, so talking about your summers at Tanglewood, I mean, you've uh, did you grow up in Boston? I don't I don't know what exactly what your bath- background is. I grew up in upstate New York okay. uh, outside of Albany, which is only about an hour. Mm-hmm. away from Tanglewood. So I grew up in a place very similar to the Berkshires. It's not quite as beautiful, but also sort of rural and trees and country roads and that kind of thing. Gotcha. Um, so with all your time at Tanglewood, what are some of like the most memorable TMC moments for you? I'm sure you have some that just stand out in your mind. So I guess musical moments first. Um, I mean, last summer we did uh, Wagner uh, Valkyrie, full opera and concert version, um, three concerts over two nights. That that will go down for me as one of my most treasured musical. I mean, it's recent, so I can remember it really well. But I, I will always uh, remember it. Um, this is a very hard question, um, but there have been a lot. If I think back to my very first summer when I was on the summer staff in 2000, when Sage Ozawa was still the music director. He did. Uh, he was doing uh, opera. He was doing uh, Falstaff, Verdi, and that was the first time I'd really seen opera up close. Because you remember the theater? Mm-hmm. It's, a, it's a small. It's like a nine hundred uh, seat uh, venue. It's a small venue, and you're, you know, Seiji Ozawa. I mean, you know, usually he's in giant houses, and here he is in this more intimate setting. And that was the first time I'd really been that up and close and personal with a with an opera like that and a music director like that. I remember I was standing backstage. Um, you know, just, you know, doing some errand for someone. And I just turned and he was there. Uh, he was conducting <laughs> a Bartok concert of orchestra that first summer, which is also really memory. And he was just like there. And I mean, he's just, the, you know, you know, that's ta- like you said, that's Tango. You yeah, know, yeah. like Yo-Yo Ma is just there. You know, that was, I had the same experience. Like Sage, he's just there. Um, <laughs> and that was, that was a very memorable moment of just uh, same, same thing with Yo-Yo actually that same summer when I was working, uh, at the front desk, uh, he had a meeting with Ellen Heistein, who's the director of the TMC, mm-hmm. which she was then and she still is. Um, and he walked in and I'm just like, hi, can I help you? He's like, oh, hi, I'm Yo-Yo. I'm like, yeah, I, I guess you are. You know? <laughs> <laughs> just sort of in my automatic, like, yes, can I help you? And, yeah. it, you know, it was Yo-Yo. It's just th- those kind of little, like, moments uh, are really memorable. I mean, there's a ton of music uh, over the years that I, I will not forget, but I'm forgetting it right now. But uh, what was the, what was the rap your summer? What'd you play? Was that uh... Uh, my first summer? The I mean, the first summer there was a ton of stuff. Um, but the the most memorable one for me in my two summers was Mahler one with Doc Nani. Yes, that was amazing. That's great. It was the most. I mean, Doc Nani, you know, rehearses and rehearses and rehearses. Um, but the clarity of it, um, I mean, just was a perfect Mahler one. I remember that well. Yeah, that was, that was cool. great. And there was there were so many people there too. It was like, yeah, it was like fifteen thousand people or ten thousand people. It was crazy. I Sunday mean, I never afternoon. experienced anything like that. It was a beautiful day. Um, I remember he was very particular about the mutes for the first movement. Yeah, he, he was very particular mutes. about the harmonics at the beginning. Yes, he like he couldn't get wanted, it. <laughs> I can't remember if he wanted metal mutes or what he wanted, but it wasn't people's little rubber mutes were not sufficient for <laughs> yeah. what he wanted for that opening. Yeah. A, yeah, because I so. remember leading up to that concert too, people were like, "Oh, he's he's very you know very particular," and I thought the guy was going to be like really mean, and it was totally opposite. He was just like very, he just knew what he wanted, you know. Yeah, he's just and, very precise, and he, and he yeah. just rehearsed it until he got it. Mm-hmm. And then the best part is like when we got to the concert, it was just like all emotion, like yeah. it was it was. Pretty incredible. I don't think I've ever, yeah. I don't think I don't know if I ever will experience another thing like that again. That was that was pretty cool. Yeah, he's a uh, he's he's you know one of these old sort of Kapellmeister types. Yeah. You know, that's a dying breed in a, in a way. Yeah. But uh, that was that was great. I mean, I love Mahler, so we've had some great Mahler 
over yeah, the years. Absolutely. Um, um, and I think, too, just talking about just the, the, I mean, the legacy, you talk about, you know, Bernstein and Copeland and all those, uh, you know, one of my favorite places to visit. And I don't know if it's still here, but in the, um, I don't remember what the building's called, but there's like a little museum. Um, mm -hmm. Visitor uh, Center. In yeah. the Visitor Center. Okay, sure. Of course, it's the Visitor Center. Um, but there's like old pictures of Tanglewood and you'll see mm -hmm. like, you know, Peter Grimes performed for the first time in the theater and you're like, oh, that's cool. I just rehearsed there and look, there's, you know, Bernstein conducting or whatever. And you're just like, it's, it's really a cool thing. Yeah. The history is, and we haven't talked too much about the history yet, but the history, so 1940, it was established and, you know, Bernstein is famously, you know, one of the members of the, the very first class. Uh, and the music director of the BSO, Serge Kuzovitsky, was his, his mentor and brought him to Tanglewood, and Kuzovitsky founded the TMC. Um, but the history of it is, you know, it's, it seems kind of trite and a cliche to say, like, oh, the, the history haunts this place. And, you know, but it really it really does. Um, it, uh, you know, the things that have happened there, the people that have walked there, all the Bernstein stuff, you know, two years ago was the Bernstein centennial. And I mean, there was just like all... Bernstein all the time, all summer. Mm -hmm. But you know, it really made you think about you know the you know the role that he played there. And I have had the privilege of doing a lot of work in the archives uh, for some writing projects and a few other archival recording project that we did a few years back, where I got to sort of uh, you know bring out some uh, you know archival recordings for release. And so I've had a lot of time to spend uh, you know with that stuff, which has been really really rewarding. I mean, the, our archives are great. We have a great archivist, Bridget Carr. Um, you know, it's, it's just, there, there's so much in there. You, you, you can't believe it. So. Yeah. And I can never miss, uh, you know, like, uh, if I find a video on YouTube of like an old Tanglewood performance, I can mm. never not watch it. And, and like, oftentimes they'll have like some aerial footage, you know, of the old, <laughs> it's just yeah. the shed. And now it's like this huge sprawling campus. It's probably different mm. now too. Cause there's that brand new building. Yes. Um, we built some new buildings last year. Um, uh, to, uh Lindy center, uh, for music and learning, um, which is a complex of three buildings, a big one, a smaller one, and the littlest one, it's sort of standard Goldilocks array. <laughs> and um, it, uh, they're fantastic. They are gorgeous. I mean, just looking at them is gorgeous. And then they sound gorgeous, too. And yeah. they're state-of-the-art. And uh, they're air-conditioned, Sam. They have air-conditioned. Well, actually, lucky for me, my <laughs> second summer, I my room in the house we stayed in had an air conditioner. So I was like yeah. one of the only people in the entire Berkshires, uh, at least they involved with Tanglewood, that had air conditioning. So Yeah, it's... Uh... It can get pretty hot, but you know it's. Uh, it can. It can get cold too. Yeah, it can also uh, be sweatshirt weather sometimes. So. Yep, it's uh, it's the mountains, yeah, sort of. It's absolutely. not like Aspen, but it's. It, we do have some mountains. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. Well, man, I could I could go on and on about all this mm -hmm. stuff and just reminiscing about stories and whatnot. But um, I the last couple of things I want to ask you. Uh, what is what is your favorite non musical thing to do in the Berkshires? I know you've you've touched on this briefly. Oh, it's changed over the years. Uh. In my younger days, we used to all go out for karaoke. That was quite a thing. I don't know if that was still a thing when you were there. You, I have seen you karaoke before. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, you don't need to go into that. Okay. Um, I, I'm sure I, 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 in my mind, I'm sure I sounded a lot better than I did in actuality. No, I, um, you know, I don't remember how you sounded, but I remember you were wearing your Tanglewood polo while doing it. Okay. So, so it was so perfect. Gotta <laughs> yeah. Going to wear the team colors. That's right. Um, I mean, to be honest, I don't often have a lot of time to do all the things I, I would like to do out there. Uh, one of my favorite things to do out there is just go for a drive yeah. and just get lost because Berkshire County is huge. It, it extends, you know, the entire north uh, north to south length, length of uh, Massachusetts um, in the west. It is a huge county. And just getting in my car and especially with someone who's never been there before, it's really fun to just sort of drive around and show all the fun places. And, you know, I also like to, um, I mean, eat. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you know. So along those it, lines, I actually have a couple questions for you. What's your favorite, like, restaurant there? Well, um, there's a couple. Um, and, and I'll, I'll add that it's not, you know, the, the food is great. Mm -hmm. But I've also really enjoyed over the years getting to know the people who work there. Mm -hmm. uh, the local business owners, the wait staff, I mean, the people who, you know, these are these are year round Berkshire residents who are, you know, they, you know, they depend on the, the tourism and, and the arts for their business and they're great people. And I've you know had some great friendships. So, you know, there's nothing more that I like to go into a restaurant and sit at the bar and have a meal and talk to the you know owner or something like that is great. But so 
there there are two restaurants that have been there for 20 years since I started. Uh, and I think they're the only two in the town of Lenox, just talking about Lenox now, mm-hmm. not some of the other uh, outlying times, which is the Heritage, which is kind of like a pub, mm-hmm. and Zinc, which is a French bistro, which is a little more upscale. And I have to say that after 20 years, those are probably still my two favorite restaurants in Lenox. There you go. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a creature of habit. There's also a great place for wings, which is far north of Pittsburgh. The Forge, right? Old Forge, yeah. Oh, yeah. Best wings in the state, at least. Um, and then there's a lot. I mean, there's, there are so many great restaurants. There's a place called uh, Cantina 229, which is down in Marlboro, which is was not there when you were a fellow. It's mm-hmm. maybe like five years old, and it's it's fantastic. It's just, it's one of these farm to table places where you're like you're sitting out back, and then you're looking at the animals that people will eat in a, you know a month. You know, you're right <laughs> on the farm. Uh, cool. It's, yeah. it's 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 great. There's there's many great restaurants. Uh, and then for my uh, for my fellow TMC alums, what is your go to Loeb's sandwich? <laughs> um, I actually like to get a BLT on a sub roll. Okay. I don't do like I might do the Italian stallion once in a while, okay. but I really like that BLT on on the sub roll. Yeah. So for any future TMC fellows, there's a grocery store. It's like a little kind of mom and pop grocery store, and they have this shop at like deli in the back, and they make these sandwiches, and dude, it's the best the best i love it so yeah i mean you, you you'll gain 10 pounds there i mean i usually <laughs> gain 10 pounds yeah uh then september i have to go on like this crazy crash diet because uh, <laughs> yeah. it's just so much to eat and you're on the go and you're grabbing something that's not good for you and i never cook and i'm really bad at this i have friends who are much better at, at cooking and thankfully they invite me over for dinner once in a while so well that's so awesome um before we leave, uh, I'd like to sort of give you the floor. I always give my guests the floor. So if you have any last words or shout outs or advice or any words of wisdom for, for the listeners in general, it's mostly clarinetists, but all musicians and friends and, and whatnot. So it's totally up to you, whatever you want to say. Well, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll certainly say that Tanglewood is an amazing place and encourage everyone to look at it as a summer festival, as a place to be. We won't... Uh, we're not accepting applications this year because of the pandemic. We've invited everyone who was meant to attend last summer to come back this summer, which really seemed like the fair thing to do. And a lot of the other festivals have done the same. But for 2022, uh, please, please do give it a look. Um, you know, uh, I can give Sam my contact information. You can put it up on your, on your website or mm-hmm. whatever. And they can reach out to me if you want um, any more information. But um, it, it, it's a very special place. Um, and I spent a lot of time during this, uh, pandemic trying to remind myself that I'm lucky for things, you know, to think of the things we have that, that are good and that we're lucky to have. And T- Tanglewood is, is really one of them and not having been there last summer really just, uh, it made that even more acute, that sense of how lucky I am to be there. I mean, you know, I'm, as an administrator, a musician, it, it, everyone there is is wonderful and you will have a wonderful time if you if you come yeah absolutely well uh, thank you michael so much for, for joining me tonight it was great to get to talk to you and and for everyone to hear more about the tmc and just tanglewood in general um it's it's on my it's like my first place that i want to visit uh, I've, I've had it on the list with my wife and i was like you got it we got to go we got to go so i'm um, hoping to get out there at some point maybe next summer or the following summer or sometime because it's just it's a special place as one of my tmc colleagues put it it's like there's effing fairy dust in the air. It's like you don't even, <laughs> you don't even like. It's 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 hard to explain. It it really, it really is. So it's a it's a bizarre osmosis of music theory that everyone absorbs. It's yeah. uh, you know, it's terrific. So uh, thank you so much. It, it, it was wonderful to visit with you. Uh, for our My new listeners, yeah, thanks. Um, for our new listeners out there, please help us get to 500 followers on Instagram by December 31st. I think we're almost at 400 now, so you guys can help us uh, push it over the edge. You can follow us on Instagram at the Candy Clarinetist for links to all of our social media and contact platforms, as well as information about myself and the podcast. Visit CandidClarinetistPodcast.com. Once again, I am Sam Rothstein, and thanks for tuning in to the Candid Clarinetist Podcast. <laughs>